The question then tonight is, Jesus the Jew, but what sort of Jew? Jesus the Jew. Yes, yes, by now, Jesus the Jew is an academic cliche. Thank you, Voltaire. Jesus the Jew, but what sort of Jew was he? It was high time to widen the circle of light around Jesus. As phenomenology stresses, no human being is adequately understood if he or she is considered in isolation from other human beings. A human being becomes fully human only by entering into dynamic relationships of friendship and love, enmity and hate, control, subordination, and collaboration with other humans. Now, if this be true of human beings in general, it is all the more true of a charismatic religious leader whose very status and impact are determined by his social relationships. It is especially true of a particular first century Jew named Jesus of Nazareth, whose adult life is largely defined in terms of his relationships to other Jewish individuals and groups in Palestine. The adult Jesus first comes into view as, notice, he joins a particular eschatological group. He doesn't go off on his own. His life begins as an adult by joining a particular eschatological group marked by baptism and repentance, a group led by a strange individual called John the Baptist. Jesus soon struck out on his own with a new message of God's imminent yet present kingdom, a message addressed not to some but to all Israel. Moving from town to town in itinerant ministry, Jesus attracted an inner and outer circle of followers from among his fellow Jews. He convinced at least some people that he had healed their illnesses or expelled their demons. He engaged in religious disputes with other devout Jews, and he presumed to teach his co-religionist how to observe the Mosaic law properly. Within his own circle, he taught his disciples special prayer forms, observances, and beliefs that marked them off as an identifiable group within, not outside of, first century Palestinian Judaism, that marked them off as an identifiable group within, not outside of, first century Palestinian Judaism. The Bible was formulated and assembled and edited and modified and censored and transmitted, first orally and then in writing, by human beings. The Bible itself doesn't claim to have been written by God. That belief is a religious doctrine of, of a much later age, and even then one wonders how literally it was meant. It's interesting to go back and look at, at some of the earliest uh, claims about the origin of the biblical text. Similarly, the so-called five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books we call the Pentateuch of Moses, um, nowhere claim to have been written in their entirety by Moses. That's not something they say of themselves. Some laws in Exodus, you know, the Book of the Covenant, a few things, yes, it says Moses wrote those down, <coughs> but not the whole five books that traditions later will ascribe to him. The Bible clearly had many contributors over many centuries, and the individual styles and concerns of those writers, their political and religious motivations, betray themselves um, frequently. Later Jewish communities chose to put all this stuff in this collection we call the Bible. The Bible is this assemblage of books and writings um, dating from approximately 1000 BCE. We're going to hear very diverse opinions about how far back this stuff dates, down to the second century. The last book within the Hebrew Bible was written in the 160s uh, BCE. Some of these stories, some of these books, which we you know, think are roughly from a certain date, they will contain narrative snippets or legal materials or traditions, oral traditions that may even date back or stretch back further in time. And they were perhaps transmitted orally and then ended up in these, these written forms. The Bible is written largely in Hebrew, hence the name Hebrew Bible. Um, there are a few passages in Aramaic. Narrative materials are an account of the odyssey of a people, the nation of Israel the rich history and literature and religious thought of ancient Israel as preserved for us over millennia in the pages of this remarkable volume. That is our topic. The Bible's not for children. I have a 12-year-old and 8-year-old. I won't let them read it. 
I won't let it read it. Those Bible stories for children books, they scare me. <laughs> they really scare me. It's not suitable for children. The subject matter in the Bible is very adult, particularly the narrative texts. Um, there are episodes of treachery and incest and murder and rape, and the Bible is not for naive optimists. These writings have had a profound and lasting impact on three world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. For the Jewish communities who first compiled these writings in the pre-Christian era, the Bible was perhaps first and foremost a record of God's eternal covenant with the Jewish people. So Jews refer to the Bible as the Tanakh. It's the term you see up here. Um, that should be also on that sheet, Tanakh, which is really the letters T, N, and Ch. Um, and they put little A's in there to make it easy to pronounce because T is hard to pronounce. So Tanakh, okay? Um, and this is a, an acronym. Um, the, the T stands for Torah, which is a word that means instruction or teaching. It's often translated law. I think that's a very poor translation. It means instruction, way, teaching. Um, and that refers to the first five books that you see listed here, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The second um, division of the Bible is uh, referred to as Nevi'im, which is the Hebrew word for prophets. The, the section of the prophets is divided really into two parts because there are two types of writing in the prophetic section of the Bible. The first or former prophets continues the kind of narrative prose account of the history of Israel, focusing on the activities of Israel's prophets, 